Charles Spurgeon once said, some Christians try to go to heaven alone in solitude. But believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks, and so do God's people. After his baptism, the very first thing Jesus did to begin his ministry on this earth was to choose other people to participate in that ministry together with him. The very last thing he did before leaving this earth was to gather those same people and instruct them to go to the ends of the earth in order to bring together as many people as they could into that ministry with them. And of course, the entire journey between those two points, Jesus was teaching them exactly how to do that, how to carry out that ministry together. In fact, everything that he taught them to do He taught them to do together. Jesus taught his disciples how to commune with God together. He taught them how to worship God together. He even taught them how to pray to God together. Jesus taught his followers how to serve God in so many different ways, but always together. In fact, the only way he never taught them to serve God was alone which wasn't a new development, by the way, for God's people in Jesus' day. The truth is, from the very beginning and throughout all of human history, God's intention for his people has been for us to be with him and to serve him together with each other, with other people, not alone. Of Of the very first human being, Adam, God said this, it is not good that the man should be alone, Genesis 2.18. King Solomon, who was described in 1 Kings 4 as the wisest man alive, said, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment, Proverbs 18.1. He also said two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. And again, as you read through the Gospels, all of Jesus' teachings and instruction were given to the disciples to be carried out together. But, But why? Why is that so important? Well, it's because that is the very essence and nature of who God is. You see, before God created anything, including the angels, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was in fellowship with itself. That's why in Genesis 1:26 God says, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." And some people say God was referring to the angels, uh, uh, the sons of God, when He said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness." I was just talking to someone about this last week, but listen, we weren't created in the image of angels. No, we were created in the image of God, which is confirmed in the very next verse, Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, which is also true, by the way, when we're born again or made new, according to the Apostle Paul, who said, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. We were created in God's image and we're commanded to be like God, to imitate God. But listen, here's the point. You cannot fully reflect his image. You cannot truly be like God. You cannot accurately imitate him when you're alone. Why not? Because God is never alone. Even when the apostles abandoned Jesus, listen to what he said. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone. For the Father is with me. John 16, 32. You see, built in to the very essence and nature of God himself is fellowship, not isolation. 
which means we cannot be like him. We cannot uh, isolate ourselves from other believers and be like God. And you understand, I'm not saying we can't ever be alone. You can't ever be by yourself. It can be very healthy, and I think sometimes it's necessary for us to spend time away from other uh, human interaction, just as Jesus did at times. But listen, even then, it's not to be alone. It's to be with God without distractions, right? And we all need that in our lives. What I'm talking about today is followers of Christ who alienate themselves from other followers of Christ, believers who avoid the church, not the building, you understand, the people, the body of Christ. And I don't just mean that in the physical sense either because I know good and well you can be in a room full of people and be utterly alone. You can attend church services and church events and church ministries and be so spiritually, emotionally, and relationally unengaged with those around you while you're there at those services and events and ministries that you might as well be there all by yourself. Listen, some of you need to hear this today. Because as Christians, we often have this attitude, and in fact, I've heard many believers say it, all I need is me and Jesus, which sounds great, except that's not what the Bible says. No, the Bible says you need Jesus and the person sitting next to you. Not for salvation, of course, that's between you and God, but to become the man or woman he created you to be, whether you like it or not, or agree with it or not, God's word is clear. If you're going to live the life you were created and called to live, you will need Jesus and your brothers and sisters in Christ because not one of you has been created or called to serve God alone. Not one of you. The fact is, We're stronger together, as we'll see in our story today as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the gospel according to Mark. So let's pick the story back up where we left off last time and see what Jesus has to say about serving him and why our spiritual health and effectiveness as followers of Christ ultimately rises or falls on our willingness and ability to do that, to serve him together. Mark chapter 14, we'll begin by reading verses 22 through 25. And as they were eating, he took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new, anew in the kingdom of God. Each year, uh, the Passover meal, there was an ancient Paschal liturgy that was observed at the table. Immediately preceding the meal, the head of the family would sit up from his reclined position, lift up a cake of unleavened bread, and recite a blessing in Aramaic. Praised be thou, O Lord, sovereign of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. And then those who were present would identify themselves with the blessing by responding with, Amen. And then the head of the family broke for each person a piece of bread and gave it to them, the bread passing from hand to hand until every guest had received a portion. And then after the meal was served, but before it was eaten, the liturgy would continue as the head of the family would again hold up the bread and say, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let everyone who hungers come and eat. Let everyone who is needy come and eat the Passover meal. Of course, it wasn't just the bread that carried the symbolic weight uh, during that meal. Everything that was eaten had a profound symbolic meaning for the Jews. The bitter herbs represented the bitterness of slavery. The salt water remembered the tears shed under Egypt's oppression. The stewed fruit, which was the color and consistency of clay, was a reminder of the bricks they were forced to make as slaves, while the paschal lamb was a reminder of God graciously and mercifully passing over the Israelites in the plague of death that came to the Egyptians, and on and on and on it goes. The celebration was so deeply meaningful to the Hebrew people that every single aspect of the meal was dripping with symbolism and remembrance. There wasn't a careless word spoken 
or a meaningless moment the entire time, which makes the words of Jesus who deviates from the Paschal liturgy so profound because he was creating a new liturgy. When he said, take this my body in the Aramaic that is translated literally as eat this my body. And then later after they eat the meal, he says that the wine is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. This was the inauguration of the Eucharist or Holy Communion as we observe it today. When Mark says that Jesus took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them. That phrase, give thanks or given thanks in verse 23 is the ancient Greek word Eucharisteo. It's where we get the word Eucharist from, which when translated into English means to be grateful. And so without a doubt, those disciples sharing in this particular Passover meal with Jesus would have clearly understood that something new, something deeply profound was happening in that moment. Unfortunately, from that day to this, there have been people who have misinterpreted Jesus' words at best and outright twisted them at worst, causing some deep misunderstandings about what the Eucharist actually is and what happens when we share in it together. One leading theology of the Catholic Church and even some Protestant churches today is the medieval doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the belief that when we share in the communion table and recite Jesus' words, that the liturgy actually alters the bread and the wine, which then literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. The argument is that that happens because that's what he said, right? This is my body and this is my blood. The problem is Jesus also said, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. He said, I'm the light of the world, John 8, 12. He said, I'm the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. He said, I'm the good shepherd, John 10, 11. He said, I'm the true vine, John 15, 1. Listen, Jesus said a lot of things about himself, and yet no one believes that Jesus is literally a loaf of bread, right, or literally a door, or literally a vine. Obviously, he often used imagery to help communicate the deeper spiritual meaning behind what we could see in the natural. So just to be clear, we do not believe in this church that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus, which brings up the second most common misunderstanding about the Eucharist, which we find mostly in evangelical churches today, those who have swung the pendulum to the opposite extreme to the point that for many believers today, communion is nothing more than a memorial. It's a time of observance where we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's nothing more than symbolism. And of course, it is that. But it's so much more than that to the point that if we stop there, if we stop at simply remembering Jesus and what he did for us when we share at his table, then we're missing out on the true depth and beauty of the Eucharist, of communion, because we're failing to recognize what Jesus was saying actually happens when we take communion together. Okay, when, when he said that the bread was his body, and so they were to eat it, he was first of all saying, just as this bread is in you, so I will be in you. But it's more than that because he was also, listen, he was pledging his personal presence to be among them every time they communed around that table together. Jesus was saying, every time you do this together, every time you come together and share in communion, when you commune with me around the table, my presence is actually there with you. And it's, it's not that he's not with us when we're alone, right? If you're a believer and follower of Christ, then his spirit resides within you. But there's a difference. When we come together, the presence of God is manifested among us in a depth and power and authority and effectiveness in ways that are beyond what we can experience when we're alone. Which is why Jesus, when instructing the disciples how to deal with trouble in the church, he says, if confronting that trouble alone by yourself doesn't work, then take other believers with you. Because where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Why didn't he just say where one is, there I am among you? 
right? There's a difference when we gather together, Matthew 18, 20, right? There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're stronger when we commune with God together, which is what makes sharing at the communion table so meaningful and so powerful and so effective and can actually bring about real change in the depth of your relationship with Christ and real change in your daily life because it's not just, uh, listen, communion is not just a bunch of Christians remembering what Jesus did for us. No, when we share in communion, we are in that moment in active fellowship with the Spirit of Christ to the degree that in that moment His presence is there among us and actively communing with us. It's also why it's not something to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul points out, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30. Some people in the church were using the things of God to abuse and malign and lord over other people, which, which religious people have been doing ever since there's been religion, right? But, but Paul's saying you can't, you can't take communion in an unworthy manner because the presence of Christ is there communing with us when that happens. We're not fooling around here, guys. We're not just remembering something that happened a long time ago. Jesus is here right now when we do this. Don't take it lightly. There's power to be experienced when we gather together. He says at the Lord's table, not because of the bread and the wine or the juice in our case, but because of what they represent. The Spirit of Christ who is in us and among us in a uniquely powerful way every time we gather and commune with Him together. Which, by the way, was clearly understood throughout the early church and the early church fathers where this last supper was almost universally recognized as the truest representation we have of fellowship with Christ. It's described that way in the Didache. It's a first century writing from the church to the nations from uh, Justin Martyr's second century works, first apology also uh, in his work Dialogue with Trypho from the third century work Reformation of all, uh, a refutation of all heresies also from Epiphanius in the fourth century. It goes on and on and on. The Eucharist was widely understood for centuries in the early church and by the church fathers as much more than just a time of remembrance. It was their primary means of communing with the presence of Christ in a depth and power that is not achievable when you're alone. You understand, this is why it's so important that we don't forsake the fellowship of the believers. This is exactly why me and Jesus isn't enough. Because when we gather together and commune with Christ together with other Christians, we experience his presence in ways that cannot otherwise be experienced. It's also why the early church celebrated communion every time they gathered. And there are plenty of churches who still do that today. In fact, it's something we've been talking about in our staff about trying to do here. But listen, no matter how often we gather around the Lord's table or simply gather as the church, it doesn't do you any good. Number one, if you're not physically present. And number two, if you're not engaged, even when you are physically present. You see, me and Jesus just isn't enough. You need other believers in your life, other believers who are able to go beyond surface level relationships with you. Because again, it's more than simply being with other people, which is why hanging out with other Christians at the coffee shop isn't church. It's why so many other gatherings that happen among Christians that we call church isn't. Because it's not about simply being together. It's also what we do when we're together. It's being together and being engaged in active and intentional communion with Christ when we're together, which doesn't have to be in a church building, right? But listen, sitting around in someone's living room, 
or a coffee shop or a walk down the trail, even if you're talking about Jesus. Look, as good as that can be, and as much as we should all do that, that is not church. Not unless you're actively and intentionally communing with Christ, which is why the communion table is so powerful, because it brings our activity while we're together into an intentional focus on Jesus Christ. And I understand this is probably rubbing some of you the wrong way. I get it because it's very popular today in the church, in the modern church, to promote the idea that the church isn't a building or a program. It's the people. It's the followers of Christ themselves, which is not wrong. It's just incomplete. Because first of all, we're not being the church when we're alone. Each one of us, apart from each other, is not the church. Every biblical metaphor for the church in scripture clearly indicates plurality never singularity we're described as a flock a building a holy nation a body of christ not just the hand of christ not just the foot of christ not just the eye of christ the church is his body all of the parts when they are put together and yet even beyond that it's more than just christians gathering in the same physical space at the same time right if we if we all go to a football game together that may be a gathering of christians and that is good but that is not church why because we're not actively and intentionally communing with christ our focus is on football and fellowship which may be great but it's not jesus when we're together and talking about life and even what God has done for you, listen, that's good and we should do that. But that is not church because we're focused on ourselves when we do that and on each other. That's good. That's not Jesus. When you have a meal with your Christian friends in your home and you have a wonderful time of Christian fellowship, you should be doing that often. It's wonderful. But that is not church because you're focused on fellowship with one another, which is great, but that is not focused, intentional communion with Christ. That's why the communion table is so important to the early church, because it took their focus off of everything else and put it squarely on Jesus. And look, all of those things that I'm talking about, those are natural and meaningful experiences that occur as a result of being a part of the church. But the church isn't actually being the church until we gather and intentionally and actively commune with Christ according to every description that we have of the church in the Bible. Every single one. Okay? Me and Jesus isn't enough. If you want your life to develop into everything that it has the God-given potential to become, then you're going to have to have the power of Christ surging through you, which means you have to learn to do more than just show up. You have to engage in relationships with other believers as you actively and intentionally commune with Christ together. There's no other way to experience the full power of his presence if there was then there would be no need for the church aw tozer once wrote unity is necessary to the outpouring of the spirit of god if you have 120 volts of electricity coming into your house but you have broken wiring you may turn on the switch but nothing works no lights come on the stove doesn't warm the radio doesn't turn on why because you have broken wiring the power is ready to do its work, but where there's broken wiring, there is no power. Unity is necessary among the children of God if we're going to know the flow of power to see God do his wonders. Let's keep reading, verses 26 through 31. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. 
But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. According to the Tosefta, it's a late second century collection of Jewish oral laws. It was common among the Jews to remain at the table at Passover for several hours after the meal was over in order to have long and meaningful conversation about God's redemption, both past and future of his people. And then the gathering was always ended with the singing of three psalms known as the Hillel, Psalms 116 through 118. And although we won't take the time to read those today, if you read them, you'll understand. It would be hard to imagine uh, the weight that those psalms must have had that particular evening for Jesus, who's singing them for the last time as they speak so powerfully to what he knew he was about to endure and ultimately overcome. And yet what is truly remarkable to me is the fact that Jesus was able to sing it all. As we'll see in the next few moments of the story, the anguish that Jesus was experiencing, knowing that he was about, what he was about to face, uh, it was overwhelming for him. And yet here he is singing in worship to the Father, right? I mean, we have a bad day. We have a bad morning. We have an argument with our spouse or one of our kids, and we want to stay home from church. We don't feel like coming and singing worship. Jesus is getting ready to die on a cross, and here he is singing songs of praise with these men, not only knowing what he's about to go through personally with his arrest, torture, and crucifixion, but listen, also knowing that he was at that very moment singing worship songs with a group of traitors. Betrayers, right down to the last man. As he points out, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. They were all, every single one of them, about to abandon Jesus in his darkest hour. In fact, the only real difference between Judas and the other 11 after that was true repentance on their part, but not before forsaking Jesus. And he knew it. He knew what he was about to face and he knew that he would be facing it without the men that he had poured out his very life for. So why bother worshiping with them now? Right before they all leave him. Right? Because Jesus knew it. Jesus knew as flawed as we are. And as unfaithful as we can be at times. He knew that we're stronger when we worship God together. Even when we don't feel like it. Even when we know the sins of the person standing next to us. Even when the weight of our circumstances is more than we can bear, we're called to worship God with our brothers and sisters in Christ, not because of how we feel, but because of who he is. We often associate worship with our mood at any given moment, so we worship and give thanks when something great happens. We worship and give thanks when life is going our way. We worship and give thanks when it feels right. Well, what about when nothing feels right? Do you worship him then? What about when your life seems to be falling apart? Do you worship him then? What about when you're suffering? Do you worship him then? Or when you feel betrayed by those closest to you, do you worship Jesus then? Because that's what he did. And he did it with others, not because of his rosy circumstances or their undying loyalty. No, he did it because he loved the Father and he wanted to please the Father even in the midst of his own suffering and betrayal. You see, we worship because it pleases God. Whether or not it pleases us is irrelevant. Yet there's something truly extraordinary about worshiping God together with other believers. It's why we don't forsake it or, or, or stay at home when we could be with the body of believers worshiping together. Psalm 22 prophetically describes the crucifixion. In fact, Jesus quotes that Psalm while he's hanging on the cross and yet right in the midst of the worst suffering imaginable. Verse three of that Psalm says, you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. When you read it in the ancient Hebrew, the word enthroned is the Hebrew word yashab. It means to inhabit 
or to dwell in. In other words, when God's people worship him together, even in the midst of our very deepest suffering, God is present because he inhabits our corporate worship. He dwells in our worship when we worship together. It's not just singing, by the way. It's every part of our life that we offer to God in a way that brings glory to him. The apostle Paul said it this way, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual uh, service of worship, Romans 12, 1. And when he says present your bodies uh, as a living sacrifice, he's not just talking about your physical body. He's talking about your entire being, every part of who you are, and how you live. And so much like Holy Communion, there is something uniquely effectual when God's people gather together for the express purpose of worshiping him. And in point of fact, I believe that is what strengthened Jesus after the Passover meal to carry on with what he knew he was called to do. Because as they sang those hymns to the Father, he was inhabiting their praises. This is why it's so Profoundly important that we never lose sight of why exactly it is that we gather on Sunday mornings and at other times throughout the week. It's it's not to hear some good music. It's not to hear some good preaching. It's not to help out the church with some money in the offering. It's not to do our good deed for the week by serving in a ministry. No, we gather to worship, period. We sing together to worship. We study together to worship. We give together to worship. We serve together to worship. And in the midst of that corporate worship, the presence and power of God dwells among us much like it does when we take Holy Communion together. You're picking up on the theme. When we commune with Christ and worship him together, we are infused with the power of his presence in ways that are otherwise unattainable. You see, me and Jesus simply isn't enough. Just look at what happened with Paul and Silas when they decided to worship God together while they were chained up in a prison. And I'll just tell you, a first century prison was nothing like a 21st century prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened, Acts 16, 25, and 26. There's so much power in our worship when we worship together. And so listen. Uh, If you're in the midst of some truly difficult circumstances today and you need the power of God to work in those circumstances, I have good news because I have the answer for you. I know exactly what you need. You need to worship him. If there's a relationship in your life that's falling apart right now and it's only the power of God that can save it, the answer is to worship him. If you need strength to get through an impossible obstacle in your life, strength that you know can only come from God, listen, the answer is to worship him. It's exactly what Jesus did in his darkest hour, and he did it with others because that is where the power of God's presence resides. Martin Luther once said at at home, in my own house, there's no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Let's finish the story for today. Verses 32 through 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? One hour. 
Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gethsemane was just east of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem across the valley of the Brook Kidron and situated on the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives and being surrounded by ancient olive trees. It was a favorite place of Jesus to go and pray. As Luke tells us in his account of the same story where he says Jesus came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, Luke twenty two thirty nine. 39. But this time it's different. This time, Mark tells us that Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And of course, Jesus says himself to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And I think it's natural to believe that that his distress is because of the horrendous torture and death that he knows he's about to experience. But the truth is there's a far greater anguish for Jesus than the physical horror of the cross. It's the spiritual horror of the cross, the reality that Jesus, the only perfect life to ever walk the earth, is about to be made sin and therefore take upon himself the wrath of God. As the Apostle Paul points out, for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And so Jesus prays, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you, Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. In other words, Father, since you can do all things, if there's any other way, if there's any other way for this to be accomplished, any other way other than me becoming sin, then please take this cup from me. And of course, we know the cup was not taken from him which, by the way, validates Jesus' claim in John 14, 6, when he says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because if there was, in fact, any other way to be saved from the wrath of God that we all deserve, if there was any other way to have eternal life, if there was any other way to go to heaven, if there was any other way to experience salvation other than through Jesus Christ, then Jesus would not have needed to become sin, and he would not have needed to die on that cross, and the Father would surely have taken that cup from him. But he didn't take that cup of wrath from Jesus because there was no other way. And Jesus understood that, which is why he says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And so he leads his disciples to the place where he often went to pray. And yet instead of sending the disciples away from him, as we've seen him do at other times in the gospel, uh, as when in Galilee, he went off to pray on a mountain alone and sent them out into the boat far from him. This time he takes them with them to the garden. And after asking all but three of them to wait there while he prayed, he takes Peter and James and John with him, not to uh, stand guard, When he says watch, he's not saying stand guard against the soldiers who will be here soon to lead me away. That part was inevitable. Jesus, again, in his darkest hour, was taking his three closest friends on this earth with him to pray because Jesus understood that we're stronger when we pray to God together. And yet here is the truly uh, remarkable part about this scene. Jesus is obviously only a few feet away from them when he prays. First of all, because what he prays is recorded here by Mark, which was given to him by Peter, who was there with Jesus that night. So he's obviously close enough to hear Jesus pray. And so here these three are hearing Jesus pray and are supposed to be watching and praying as well. And yet the amazing part is the fact that Jesus wasn't asking them to pray for him. He was telling them to pray for themselves and for each other. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, I'm not the only one who's about to be tested here. 
You need to pray together for yourselves and for each other that you will be able to face what is coming, but instead they fall asleep. So he interrupts his own prayer, arguably the most important prayer ever prayed in the history of the world. He interrupts his own prayer to wake up his three friends so that they will continue to pray together for themselves and for each other, knowing what he was about to have to endure. Jesus is still thinking about the welfare of his disciples. It is astounding, both the level of care that Jesus had for his followers and the level of priority and power that he assigns, not just to praying, but to praying together, which makes sense that when his disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, back in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You understand, he wasn't just teaching them how to pray. He was teaching them how to pray together because there's great power available to us when we pray together. In fact, it's a power manifested by his spirit through us that cannot be experienced any other way. Those other uh, followers, those early followers, they understood it well. James, the brother of Jesus, said, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders, not the elder, the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, what prayer? What prayer of faith? The prayer of the elders, praying together with faith. That prayer will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He didn't say pray for yourself that you may be healed. He said get together with other Christians and pray and you'll be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working, James 5, 14 through 16. Do we have any idea what is available to us? In other words, there's this great power, James says, available when we pray for and with each other, when we pray together. That's why here at this church, we pray together at the beginning and middle and end of every corporate gathering because there's supernatural power at work in and through us when we pray together. That's why we pray in the altars, and when we do, we invite many to come and pray with us because there's power when we pray together. That's why we have a group prayer app that I don't know how to use, but it's awesome because we send out requests and needs to the entire body because there's power when we pray together. That's why we insist on every single community group that they set time aside every time they meet to pray together because there's power when we gather and we pray with and for each other. And listen, there's no substitute. There's no substitute for corporate prayer, which is why every time a disciple was beaten and persecuted in order to stop preaching the gospel, the church didn't petition the government or even rally around a new leader who would be more sympathetic to their cause. No, they gathered together to pray. Every time someone was imprisoned or faced death, they didn't storm the jail or revolt against the authorities. No, they gathered together to pray. Every time they needed guidance and direction for their future, they didn't consult a financial planner or a life coach. They gathered together to pray. Every single time, one of their own was in great need, whether it be their health or some heavy decision that needed to be made or any great circumstance they were facing. They didn't send out positive thoughts and good vibes. They gathered together to pray. And listen, I'm not saying they didn't pray on their own. Surely they did. But when the chips were down and the stakes were high, 
when they were facing truly dire circumstances, when their future was most uncertain and the world was bearing down upon them, they didn't cower in their homes alone and pray. No, they came together and bombarded heaven as with one voice because they knew hands down, without exception, the most powerful thing they could do in their greatest hour of need was to gather and pray together. Megan Hill said the church is not merely a roster of individuals who pray privately. It is a congregation that ought to pray together. It's a continuous thread that runs through Scripture. When we commune with Christ together, when we worship Him together, when we pray as one voice together, our lives are infused with the power of his presence. Listen, in ways that are otherwise unattainable. There's simply no substitute. There's no valid alternative to God's people spending focused time communing and worshiping and praying together. Whether you like it or not, it's a fact. If you want to become everything he's created you to be, then me and Jesus just isn't enough because you need all of the other parts of the body to realize all the God-given potential that he's put inside of you. There's no other way to fully reflect his image. There's no other way to truly be like God because you cannot fully imitate his nature or experience all of his power that is available to you when you are alone because the very essence and nature of God himself is to be in fellowship with others. That's who he is. And that's who he's created us to be, one with him and one with each other. Okay? Me and Jesus, it simply isn't enough. If you want your life to develop into everything that it has the God-given potential to become, then you're going to have to have the power of Christ surging through you, which means you have to learn to do more than just show up. You have to engage in relationships with other believers as you actively and intentionally commune with Christ together and worship him together and pray to him together. There is no other way to experience the full power of his presence, which is why he instituted the church to begin with, because we are stronger together. Let's pray.